I'm in Monterey, California, in front of the single largest attraction in this waterfront town. You can spend hours inside this facility looking at fish, learning about fish, hearing stories about fish. Fish stories seem to be a part of who we are as people. Fish stories range from two guys in a small boat bragging about the one that got away. Fish stories also include classic literature about Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. I'm certain that as long as men have sought to harvest fish from the sea, there have been and always probably will be stories about fish. Scripture is not without its fish stories. There's a fish story about a hungry crowd and a borrowed lunch that contained fish. Jesus blessed and broke the fish and fed a multitude. Peter found himself one day needing some money for an unexpected temple tax. Jesus' solution? A fishing trip. Put your line into the water and catch a fish. Take some coins out of the fish's mouth and pay the temple tax for you and me. Don't you just know that that's a story that Peter shared a few times? Don't you know that there were a lot of people in Capernaum who tried to catch their tax money after they heard the story? Then there's the granddaddy of all fish stories, Jonah swallowed by a great fish, a whale. This is one that's been argued about, speculated over forever. People have even used this story in an effort to discredit scripture altogether. We'll talk about the fish, the great fish, the whale in this story. But the story of Jonah is more than a fish tale. As a matter of fact, every time there's a fish tale in scripture, there's more to it than the fish. It wasn't about a borrowed lunch, the fish, it was about hungry people. It wasn't about the money in the fish's mouth. It was about a lesson that Peter needed to learn about who Jesus is. And the book of Jonah is exactly the same. It's more than a fish tale. It's a book of themes, principles, and lessons that are designed to help you understand God and to help you respond to people in a fashion that God expects. We will talk about the fish but there's more to it than that. It's about you. About a year ago, I taught a single lesson on an aspect of the book of Jonah. And on that day, I promised you that within a year, I would come back and do an entire series on the book of Jonah. I went back that day, wrote it down on my calendar. It's been almost exactly a year, and I am here to do a series with you on this book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is four, book, or four chapters long. It's a very brief book. It's an easy one to read in one sitting. And I would ask, as we're in this study, that every week you would spend time to maybe read the book of Jonah one time during the week just to prepare yourself for the lesson that we're going to have. I, we're going to read some scripture to you today. We're not going to read the whole book to you today. But if you'd like to grab a uh, church Bible, you're on page 644. I will help you find Jonah. If you have your own Bible with you, good for you. You're going to have to find Jonah on your own. It's there at the end of the Old Testament. Very small book. I'm glad you're here today. And I have purposely selected to do this series at this time of year. During this time of year, there's a lot of travel that goes on. There's a lot of vacationing that goes on. There's a lot of people that are out of town and they're not at church. They're not at this church. They're visiting at another church. And I really waited to do this lesson until a time of year when I knew the core of Bethel Church was going to assemble and I could talk straight with you about some principles to the core of who this church is about the heart of God. This is a unique little book. It's brief, as I said. It's the only book in which the writings are about the lessons that a prophet learned instead of the lessons that a prophet taught to people. We have become, I'm afraid, a little too familiar with this book. It's kind of a joke. We joke about the whale. We joke about Jonah in a whale. We laugh at it. We don't take this little book very seriously, and because of that, I'm afraid we're in danger of missing some incredibly significant lessons and principles from God's heart for us in the 21st century as we dismiss this book as laughable. The story doesn't take long to explain, but it takes a lifetime to live out the lessons that are contained in these four chapters. 
This book is a great reminder that even the most mature Christians still need to grow. The book is going to center on a character who is a prophet, a veteran Christian, a veteran believer, a long time believer in God, a, a prophet. And yet there are some things that he's missing that God wants him to pick up. Even the most mature believer needs to grow. Jonah's growth wasn't needed in the area of knowledge. It was needed in the area of application of the knowledge he had attained. His attitude needed to grow. His love needed to grow. Many Christians don't need more information. Many Christians don't need more knowledge or more great teaching. What they need is to apply what it is they've already learned. If we have increasing knowledge and no application, we create rebellious Christians. This little book reflects God's perspective on veteran believers who don't get it. The book is not a prophetic utterance, it's a prophetic story. This little book has four parts, and it's divided up where each chapter is a unique part of the story. And today my goal is to give you an overview of this book so that we have general understanding of these four chapters and what happens and how this story progresses. And then we're gonna come back over the next several weeks and we're going to grab themes out of this book and principles from this book, and we're gonna spend a week on each of those. But today is designed to give us an overview of the book to make sure that everybody is up to speed understanding the, the basic story and plot of this little book. The first chapter, I told you that this book is divided into four sections uh, according to its chapters, and the first chapter is all about Jonah running away from God, and we're going to pick up our reading in chapter one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they cried to the Lord, Oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not let it hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. Chapter 1 is about a prophet who is on the run, on the run from God. This man's name, Jonah, means dove. He's the son of Amittai. He's from the tribe of Zebulun. He's from the city of Geth Hefer, from the region of Galilee, 60 miles up the coast from Joppa. He's about 500 miles from Nineveh and 2,000 miles from Tarshish, which is the most western city of its day in the exact opposite direction from Nineveh. Nineveh is where the enemy lived. Nineveh is where the military might of that enemy resided. It's the very heart of Assyria. And sitting in this strategic spot, at this strategic time, is a man, a prophet, named Jonah. God's choice to go and to bring a message to people who were in desperate need of knowing who God was. People who would never know. People who would never hear unless God sent somebody to where they were. The theme of this book is not difficult to understand. The theme of this book is not hard to relate to. The theme of this book is commonplace even for today. The theme is this. From God's perspective, it's a story about God's mercy. From Jonah's perspective, this story is a story of stubborn pride. 
This is not a book that centers around the story of a whale. This is not a book that centers its purpose around the story of a plant that offered shade to the prophet. Nor is this story about a ship that the prophet was thrown off of. This book is about God dealing with a wayward believer, a man who would not obey him and would not do the things that God had asked him to do. In these four chapters, really, the whale is insignificant. The ship is insignificant. The plant is insignificant. The significant things in this book are the man and his God getting on the same page so that people who are in desperate need of a message of hope can obtain that. The first chapter is this, young man, or this man on the run. Rollo May said this, man is the only creature that runs faster when he loses his way. John Ray, the 18th century naturalist, says, what's the use of running if you're on the wrong road? Chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It was clear. It was not from a man. It was not in a dream. It was direct communication, revelation, and impartation from God. And Jonah heard the command of God. He understood the instructions. It was clear. Arise, go to Nineveh, and cry out against that city. Their wickedness has come up before me. It's a direct message from God. God says an interesting thing here. He says, their wickedness has come up before me. God is not fooled about this city. God is not ignorant about this city. God knows the wickedness of this city. He knows how horrible this city is. This city is a huge city. Uh, scholars say somewhere between 600,000 and 750,000 inhabitants in this city. It was a massive city, but it was also a brutal and a vicious city. This is a, it's a well-known fact that these people that after a war would decapitate their victims and stack their heads in stacks as a warning to people. God knew all of that. God knew how vicious they were, and God knew how wicked they were, and how evil they were, and God said, I love them and I want somebody to go and take the message to them. He also knew that they were like that because they didn't know him. And I love the fact that even though they are vile and they are wicked and they are cruel, God did not turn his back on this city. Instead, he recruits a man named Jonah and he says, go and tell them this. God wanted to reach people so he sent a person. That's how it always works with God. When God wants to impact somebody or a city or an area or a community or a neighborhood, he always uses people to impact other people with his message. God didn't ask Jonah to go where it was safe. He didn't ask Jonah to go where it was gonna be easy or where all the people agreed with Jonah and thought like Jonah and believed like Jonah. Jonah was asked to go to a cruel, wicked, horrible people that needed God. God said, go. Go to a place that was nothing like Jonah. He was a Jew. This was a group of Gentiles. Jonah, you go to Nineveh. Jonah says, I understand, God. I will now go in the complete and total opposite direction and aim as far away as possible from where you have asked me to go. It's like God saying to you, go to San Francisco, and you buy a ticket for New York City. The opposite direction. He has no intention of obeying God. His goal is... The Bible says clearly is to flee from the Lord, to flee from the presence of the Lord. The original language here suggests that he had purpose. He had purpose in running away. His purpose was to get away from God. He didn't want the people to be changed. He didn't want to see God's mercy at work on them. He had a problem with God's grace. In chapter 4, after the revival takes place in this story, he yells at God and says, I knew this is how you would be. I don't like your character, God, that you're this forgiving. He has an intent in his heart. He's afraid that God will be kind and forgive and restore, and he simply doesn't want that. And so what he does 
as he runs as far and as fast and as hard as he can. And some of you today, this whole thing about running is nothing that has stopped with the book of Jonah. It has gone on right up until this moment in some of your lives. Some of you here today in the hearing of my voice or on the internet as you listen to me, you are running from God. You are making tracks to the best of your ability to get away from where God is. I have visited many penitentiaries. I sat in a lot of cell blocks and prayed with a lot of inmates and most of them have a praying mom and a praying grandma and at one time were in church and are running from God and they said this to me. I can't believe that even in here, I can't get away from God. You can run as fast as you want. God's faster. You can go wherever you want. He's already there. It is an exercise in futility to try and outrun God. And in this whole story, and in this whole study, we're gonna watch how God deals with somebody who is trying to run away from him. And if you're here today and you're running from God, I'm not asking if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. If you've been following Jesus for a long time or you're just brand new or you're just considering the claims of Christ in your own life, if you are running away from what God has on your life, I want you to know today, he's not mad at you. You're not the first person that's run from him. He has dealt with many that have run, with him, run from him. He loves you. He has a plan. And just because you're running, he's not going to stop. Just because you're running, he's not going to quit. Just because you're running doesn't mean he's going to change his mind about how awesome you are and how passionate he is about who you are. Some of you are on the run. And you're going to watch God deal with a guy today that was on the run and he should have known better. The book is incredible. It's reality. It reveals some of the motive that people have even today, but they won't say it. Jonah was upset with God about caring for a certain group of people that he didn't want cared for. We would never be so bold as to say that. We will, however, ignore the command to go. Some people will head in the opposite direction when they learn about a need that is in somebody's life that they don't care for. They will ignore people they dislike. They will withhold God's word and God's love and forgiveness from people that they have prejudice against. This is a lot more than a cute little story on a flannel graph. It's a tough reality. The thing that makes it the toughest for me is this is all about a mature believer who should have known better, who did know what to do and just chose not to do it. He doesn't want to get it. He doesn't want to obey. His personal prejudices are more important to him than obeying God. Jonah said, no, I want you to judge them. And for that reason, I'm booking passage, and I am heading in the opposite direction. There's two things about God you have to know when you're, in, when you're in running position. You can't outrun him, and he won't change his mind just because you're on the run. He's in the boat, he's running, and God prepares a storm. The storm didn't just happen to occur, it was prepared by God, it was sent by God. It's amazing thought that God would stand a storm to deal with a disobedient servant, but that's exactly what he did. It's interesting that Jonah had purpose in his mind, but God was prepared even for Jonah's purpose. That's the great thing about God is you can't outmaneuver him. His plan is still in force. You can think you are so clever, and yet God's plan will never take a back seat. The sailors become afraid in the storm. They start throwing all the cargo overboard, and Jonah is asleep. In verse 5 of this first chapter, he sleeps. The sailors come to him, and they wake him up. They are having a prayer meeting. The pagans, the sailors, are having a prayer meeting, and the man of God is asleep in the ship. And the captain comes and wakes him up and says, Hey, wake up, we're having a prayer meeting. You get up and call on your God. 
Isn't that something? Then in that situation, the pagans know to pray, and the man of God is trying to sleep. They cast lots to determine who's at fault, and the lot falls to Jonah. He wins, loses, <laughs> whatever. It falls on him. And they said, who are you, and what do you do, and who's your God, and what is going on? And at the end of Jonah's speech, he says, I'll tell you what you need to do. Throw me overboard. I'm a prophet. I'm the cause. I'm running from my God. Throw me into the sea. He had no idea about the fish. He knew this would mean his death. Here you see Jonah continuing to run, trying to escape the presence and the call of God on his life. And this is what he's come up with. Throw me into the ocean. This isn't so that he can swim to shore. This is so that he can just close the chapter out. He's thrown in, and the sea goes calm. From turbulence to calm in a second. And God comes back and saves Jonah by providing a great fish. And the fish comes up, and there is a reverse sushi moment right here. <laughs> the fish eats the man. And for three days and for three nights, Jonah makes his home inside the belly of this fish. That's chapter one. Chapter two, we see a whole different side of Jonah. If from the belly of the fish, chapter two is a prayer. He is now running to God. He has stopped his running from God, and now he's going to run to God. And I want to just share with you the first and the last verse in this, in this brief chapter, which is a prayer. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. You've heard it said that in foxholes there are no atheists. Well, in whales' bellies there are no atheists. This is a guy who is running from God. He doesn't want to be with God. He doesn't want to be around God. He doesn't want to hear God's word. He doesn't want to hear God's plan. And all of a sudden, there's a turn in situations, and this man can't wait to pray. All of a sudden, now he wants to talk to God. Has it ever been like that in your life where you've just gone years or months or days or weeks without any kind of prayer, and all of a sudden something caves in, something goes crazy, something happens, there's a doctor's report, there's a situation with your spouse, there's a situation with your kid, there's a situation with your money, and all of a sudden you can pray. And boy, can you pray. You have some of the greatest prayer meetings of your life when things are going crazy and you don't know what's going to happen next. That's what happens to God's man. He is in the belly of a fish, and all of a sudden, that which the captain of the ship had to prod him to do, he now is able to do on his very own. No captain has had to wake him and say, stand up and pray. No, he's praying. In verse 9, he says this in chapter 2, but I with a song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Now the vow I think that he's referring to here is the one that he took as a prophet to do what God asked him to do. He's saying, God, I'm going to renew my vow to you, and I'm going to do it with thanksgiving. He's learning to be grateful in the belly of a fish. This is a turning point. God has saved my life. I'm thankful. I'm singing a song of thanksgiving. God is to be taken seriously. I will sacrifice. I will obey. This chapter, the first six verses, has to do with the faithfulness of God. And the last couple of verses, seven through nine, deal with the seriousness of the vow that Jonah needed to live up to. And after this prayer meeting, I don't know how long the prayer meeting was. We just know that it was three days and three nights that he was in the belly of this fish. He is deposited out on dry ground. Can you imagine how he looked? Can you imagine how he smelled? Can you imagine what walked into the city? Can you imagine? 
All I know is that after three days and three nights, Jonah is vomited onto the shore, and this is what he says. I'm ready to preach. I cannot wait to get to Nineveh. There is nothing the Ninevites can do to me that is worse than what that whale's digestive tract has been doing to me. I am anxious to tell the story that God wants me. Where do I preach? Where is my pulpit? Chapter 3 is Jonah running with God. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A sit of visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city and he proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Chapter 3 and chapter 4 in this brief book contain uh, information and a snapshot of the greatest revival of all time. There's no revival greater in the history of our world, not in Scotland under John Knox, not in England under Wesley or Whitfield, not in the United States under Moody or Billy Graham. This is the number one revival. It's incredible. And in chapter 3, God starts by restating his command. I like that because God doesn't change. Just because the first two chapters have happened doesn't mean that God has changed. He hasn't changed his opinion about the Ninevites, but my friends, he hasn't changed his opinion about Jonah either. And some of you are here today, and you need to hear me for just a minute. You've been serving God, you've been a Christian, you've been following the concepts and the precepts of Christ, but there has been a season in your life where you did some really crazy things and you did some crummy things, and you are convinced today that God cannot use you because of a difficult season in your life. You are convinced that it is over, that God has washed his hands, and I would have loved to have used you, but now because of what you've done, you are useless to me. I have heard so many people tell me, I wish I hadn't made that mistake. Because I made that set of mistakes, God can't use me anymore. That is not the picture in this book. The third chapter begins by God reinstating the command to Jonah and saying like this, I know about the first two chapters. I know you ran from me. I know what your heart is. I know how you tried to get out of my presence. I know you made mistakes, but I am God and I don't change and I still want to use you. You are not disqualified because of mistake in your life. That is a lie from the devil to marginalize you and to set you to the side. Right here, God could have selected another prophet. God could have raised up another individual. God could have killed Jonah on the bottom of the ocean. Story over. That's not what he did because he still loves Jonah and he still has a plan even though he rebelled and had a problem. Just because you have a problem, just because you've gone in the wrong direction, just because you didn't do it the way it was supposed to be done the first time does not mean that God does not have plan for you and purpose for you. I hope that encourages you today. The command is restated, but there's one change. The first time he says, go and call out against this great city. The second time he says, you speak what I give you. And this time Jonah obeys. He goes to Nineveh. He walks through the streets of Nineveh and he preaches. All the people hear the message of warning and the message of warning goes all the way up to the king. And the people respond. They repent, they fast. And the king makes a declaration. This is incredible. God sees all this repenting, this massive revival that's going on in Nineveh, and he relents. He shows compassion and chooses not to destroy them. In chapter 4, after this amazing revival, 
Now we're going to watch Jonah go head to head with God, running out ahead of God and banging heads with God. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Jonah's going to bang heads with God. Chapter 4 contains information about the only crusade where the evangelist needed follow-up. Usually, it's the new converts that need the follow-up, but in this story, the evangelist needs help. Here, the man used by God, and you would expect him that his issue at this time, after a city of that magnitude turning to God, that the issue in his heart would have been pride, pride over accomplishment. But no, he's angry. He's displeased with God, and he goes as far as to confront God, angry over the fact that lives were changed, that lives were spared from judgment. Obviously, the lessons from the great fish are wearing, their effect is wearing off. It's amazing how in the belly of the fish we can make vows to God. It's amazing how our prayer life increases during the pressured times of life. And as soon as things start to get good, how we can begin to lose the fervor of our prayer and the fervor of our commitment to connecting with God. As a pastor, I have seen far more people walk away from God over success than failure. And here we have God's man who in the belly of a fish prays articulate prayers and yet after revival goes back to the same heart and begins to have an argument with God over the character of God. He says to God, I told you this would happen. I knew you were like this. That's why I ran. God, I know your faults. Your faults are that you're loving and you're kind and you're forgiving and it irritates me. It irritates me, God, that you're like that toward people that I don't like. This man is a bigot. He has prejudice against Gentiles. His own hate is getting into the way of being a responsible believer and as a prophet doing what God asked him to do. Jonah is demonstrating the opposite characteristics of the God that he represents. In verse 3, he will try death as an answer once again. God, just take my life. The Lord counsels him, and he counsels him with questions. It's interesting that we look objectively at Jonah, but haven't we done similar things in our own lives as Christian people? Accusing God of falling short of our plans and our ideas? running from God in areas where we understand that our obedience is required, using God's character against him as justification for our disappointment in the way that he acted. God deals with Jonah, and he comforts him, and he provides a plant to help Jonah with some shade, and Jonah gets attached to the plant. He's caught up in his comfort, and he's caught up in what he has. All the while, he's not in the city with the people. He's not in there taking care of all of those people that have just turned their lives to God. He's outside under a plant, ignoring the people in the city. He's loving the plant, care less about the people. This is all about his momentary comfort. And when the plant dies, Jonah again calls for his own death. And God says, do you really have a good reason to be angry about this plant? He says, yes, yes, God, I do have a reason to be angry about this plant. Unto death, I have a right to be angry about this plant. 
God ends this book in an interesting fashion. He ends it with a question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? It's sad that we read this book and we relegate it to a story about a whale. It's sad that this story has become a little bit laughable because all we think about is what kind of fish it was or what kind of a whale it was and if scripture could really be accurate in recording such a crazy story. But there are two things that are not laughable about this book, but rather memorable. One is it is utterly impossible to escape from God. And number two, it is absolutely essential that we submit to the will of God in our lives. This book is a lasting reminder of some very key principles about God. This little four chapter book is not just a fish tale. It's a serious little book. It reveals the heart of God. It reveals what God expects for you and for me to value. It reveals how even veteran believers sometimes don't get it. It reveals how God deals with disobedient believers. It's more than a fish tale. It's a tale of God's patience. It's a tale of God's forgiveness. It's a tale of salvation. It's a tale of questions that God asks his people when they're off track. It's a tale of running. And it's a tale of people who know and people who need to be told. I don't know your story today, but I know that within the size of this congregation and the listening audience online this week, that some of you are running from what God has said to you. And I am here today not to rebuke you, not to expose you, not to chastise you, but to remind you again that God will not change his claim on your life because you're running. He loves you, and for as many people as he has allowed to be created, he has that many plans ready to be instituted. Are you running from God? Today would be a great day to stop. All you're going to do is wear yourself out, and wherever you go, he's already there. Would you bow your heads, and would you close your eyes? I'd like to have a word of prayer with you this morning. I want to pray for you today. If you're in a running mode away from God. And before I get to that, maybe you're here today and you've been running from God. You know Christians. Maybe you went to church at some point in your life. Maybe your mom prays for you. Maybe your grandma prays for you. Maybe your dad prays for you. And you've been running, and the only reason you're here today is because somebody invited you, and things have gotten so uncomfortable in your life that you decided that you just give this a try. I'm really glad you're here. God had one son, he sent him to this earth, and he died on a cross so that your sins could be forgiven, and you and God could have a relationship. Not only can you not outrun God, God is in pursuit of you. He has come to where you're at so that you and he can have a relationship. And today, if you're interested in having a relationship with God, you want him to forgive you of your sin, you want to surrender your life today, you want to stop the running and give your life to God, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And I would ask, just right where you sit, with your eyes closed, your head bowed, that you would just quietly repeat this prayer right after me. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned. I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life and change me. Change who I am and change what I am. 
I give my life to you. I'm done running. I give myself to you.